Hello, my name is David Woodman. Some of you will already know me from last year's Imagine event. For those of you who might not though, I'm an art director that has been in the games industry now for over 14 years and have worked on 19 published titles. The majority of my time in the industry I've spent as either a lead artist or an art director, but I have done many other things like level design, gameplay setup, scripting, environment art, UI and VFX. I have also worked across many platforms, from mobile all the way up to next-gen consoles and PC. So I have had a really varied experience that crosses a few disciplines and types of gaming hardware. Before working in the industry though, my first taste of development was back in the late 90s. Every evening after school, I would work on my own game modifications, mostly making multiplayer levels for popular first-person shooters of the day. After completing school, I went on to art college, where I studied traditional art and also graphic design. During this period, as a continuation of my hobby, I started teaching myself more in-depth aspects of game development. After three years of art college, I went on to university and completed a degree in game design. This is where I became more focused towards game development as a possible career. But truthfully, when I started the course, I had no idea where that would take me. At university, I had a couple of really great lecturers and peers. Looking back, that was a really important moment in setting me on my trajectory into the industry. Halfway through my third year at university, my portfolio caught the attention of a developer. Subsequently, I got hired by an independent studio and my career began. Hopefully, that should give you a super condensed version of my route into the industry and my history with game development. So, in this short video, I'm going to discuss creativity beyond the concept art. Many of us will be familiar with concept artists being some of the most creative and talented people to work with in the games industry. They often produce fantastic work that is not only informative and functional to the look of the game, but also inspires everyone across the team to create something special. But in this short video, I really want to focus on the creative aspect after the concept phase has concluded. So how that might come about and what can take place after the concept artist has handed over a final image, where assets can still be developed and visually taken a stage further after the broad strokes have been laid down. To give some context, in my mind I have always thought of it like this. Concept art helps set the tone and direction, answers the big questions, but it's only once the asset goes into production can all the details and nuances be explored and added. Those who generate the 3D assets are creative too, just with a different tool set. A looser concept allows room for their imagination, for them to exercise that equally valuable creative input. To demonstrate the principles of continuing to develop an idea after the concept stage, I will show you this sci-fi headgear object I created in collaboration with lead concept artist Sean Mooney. This will help provide some context to how we can continue to evolve the visuals of an object from a single concept image. Even though this concept image doesn't have all the details worked out for me, it provides more than enough information to be going on with. Using a few practices and principles, we can not only fill in the blanks, for example, what does the back of this headgear even look like? But we can continue to develop the idea and build in more detail. So to give a quick brief of what the headgear concept is, it's an Eastern Bloc style piece of military equipment that has come from a reimagined 1960s Cold War era. The objective here was to hit the visual points of Cold War, retro, sci-fi, along with the very distinctive robust look Eastern Bloc military hardware had back in the 60s. I appreciate it's a lot to take in in two sentences, but hang in there with me. Keeping these underlying points in mind is the first step to bridging the gap between the loose concept art you can see on screen and the final result we ended up with. In an ideal world, it's great to work from a completely finished and polished piece of concept art. By this I mean, where everything has been worked out ahead of time best it can, both visually in structure and form, the materials, colouring and lighting. This would often take the shape of a few concept images. A few angles have been drawn up, including profile shots, so the artist building the 3D asset has a really complete picture of what is required down to every nut and bolt. This also extends to solving any problems that may reveal themselves during the concept stage, not only visually but in terms of practicality. So as an example of that, that could be how does this animate or what special effects are required. This type of detailed and thorough concepting all takes time of course and the creativity and problem solving aspects are all front loaded into the concept artist schedule. What I have described is the absolute ideal scenario, but because this project had to move quickly, we have a much looser final concept image. Those unanswered questions should not be seen as a negative though. Yes, it is extra work, 
but it is also an opportunity to have some fun and add your own ideas. With a project like this that has to move quickly, it's critical to remind ourselves of what the goal is, to create an asset we're happy to have in the final game. That's not to say concept isn't important, but rather it's a critical step to achieving that final goal. At the start of this project, we went through the typical process of exchanging ideas, gathering reference, thumbnailing concepts and loose 3D blockouts, then iterating over the last two points a few times. Being involved with the concept process helps bridge the gap when information may be missing during the final art stage. One thing I found that certainly helps when a concept image can't provide all the answers is having access to the same reference images that inspired the artwork. In this example, myself and Sean had the same set of reference images to work from. This drives continuity from the initial concept direction through to the final look of the asset. So the first task for me to do once the concept image was handed over was to identify the key elements that needed attention outside of executing the final art. I broke these down as follows. So firstly, refining the structure and detail. So that means evaluating the proportions and scale, the level of detail present and where I may need to introduce more or conversely remove some too. Secondly, functionality. Does it look like it will work? This is often something that has to be contended with when translating a 2D image into a 3D object. Thirdly, what does the back of the headgear look like? We can see from the provided concept, there was limited information on this, so I would have to design this. And finally, materials. This is where the concept was light on information, so there's plenty of questions for me to find answers to. So we will look back at these four areas, the changes I made, and how they helped evolve the concept image into the end result. So let's dive into refining the overall structure and detail. Where did this take place and why? Here are a few examples. You can see here on the leading edge of the goggles that I actually removed some of the detail compared to the concept. This was to create some dead space in all the detail we can see on the frontal area. Where we have detail is just as important as where we don't. The principle here is to give the viewer's eye a rest between all the intricacy found in this area. Later on in the texturing process, this also gives a nice chunk of area for the material to do its work. You can also see I made significant changes to the headphones. Not only have the overall proportions been altered, but they've also been angled in at the base. Two factors drive the decision to make the angle adjustment from the original concept. The first is how the supporting rails for the headphones follow the contour of the head. They taper in slightly, so this will also affect the headphone angle. The second factor is the subtle detail of them leaning in adds weight to the entire structure. As gravity pulls down from the top of the head, the chin strap causes everything to pull in lower down. Taking this principle of weight into the sculpting stage for the fabric also helped guide how creases would form in areas of tension or compression. For example, the pins we can see on the forehead pad, these pins look like they would screw in, so they would compress and pinch the fabric around these areas. Here you can see I also made changes to the proportions of the side dial. This was to allow a larger screen to display more information. This builds detail and adds additional interest from the original concept. I also introduced a rubber strip around the outside. This was added to help the user grip the control surface if the equipment gets wet. We can also see in other areas of the headgear I have applied this method of thinking. Anything that the user has to rotate will require extra grip. So really thinking about functionality, which I'll touch on a bit more in a minute. Whilst the concept does not speak directly to us to add these details in, they are all inspired from the spirit of the concept image, if you like. That really goes back to my point earlier about the concept art inspiring the creator of the final artwork. So let's go a bit deeper on the topic of functionality and how that applies here to the headgear. In this instance, that boils down to, does it look like it will function in relation to the wearer and any activities they may be required to undertake? When items are mass produced for something like the military, we can see there is a criteria that has to be met when considering functionality. Survivability. Under tough conditions, will this item protect the wearer and continue to function as required, whatever the combat and environment conditions may be? Durability. Will this piece of equipment operate without maintenance or repair for months at a time? It needs to be robust and reliable, so the user has confidence it will perform when it is needed most. And finally, ergonomics. Is the headgear designed to fit the individual that will operate it? We have to think the operators wearing this equipment will be out in the field all day and night. The last thing you would want is an uncomfortable piece of kit that depletes the energy quicker. Now, this might sound closer to product design, but for me having points like this in mind helps inform my decisions when considering the overall direction all the way down to the small details. The concept image already placed us some of these points. For example, the battery pack placed to the rear of the headgear. This is by design to balance out the weight of the equipment on the front, 
This comes from how night vision systems are configured in real life. Going a step further, we can see how the goggles at the front has an adjustable arm. This is so it can fit comfortably to the user's head shape. The back section echoes this design too. It is set up to be adjustable, to shift the weight forward and back. This helps maintain balance when we consider the centre of gravity for the entire setup. From an ergonomics point of view, you would want the centre of gravity to be in line with the neck, so as not to pull the head either forward or backwards. One of the other immediate changes I made from the concept was the addition of a fastening system around the bottom of the head. This is a part of thinking about how it fits to the user, but also the general theme of adjustability throughout. The headgear will be mass produced for the military to use, so it'll have to fit all sorts of head shapes, large and small. It's a simple thing, obvious if you like, but without adding it, the headgear makes less sense. We can see from the concept image, we have no information on the underside of the goggles, but we can make a fair assumption that this will be designed to follow the contours of the human face, and to have support to help hold the weight of the equipment away from the head. So, thinking about functionality and ergonomics in relation to the user, would this be comfortable? We can also presume from the concept, because the goggles fit so snug to the face, that they're designed to shield the user's eyes from the environment, water, dirt, and so on. So this design principle would be followed underneath too. Also, parts of the underside structure would have to be designed to allow for different head shapes. On screen now, we can see the flexibility built into the structure of the headphone mounts. These allow for the potential different shapes of operator heads. Because these are flexible, any connecting parts, such as the cables that feed into the headphones, need to have enough length to support any adjustment the user might make. This extends to the entire object to ensure any cables have enough slack so they look like they could support any range of movement required. One final aspect of functional military equipment is the concept of modularity. No matter how robust parts are built, components will get damaged and need replacing. To cater for this, the headgear system is designed to have that modular feel. The concept features this, and in the final art, we can take this a step further down into the finer details. So we think about how different elements connect to each other. So as a simple example, how the headphone wires are connected with big durable plugs, so it's quick to change out a possible broken earpiece. Applying this thinking throughout adds up to help build on the original concept provided. Let's now take a look at how the back of the headgear was generated. So we can see from the concept image, we have little information on the back, but taking a couple of observations from the front, we can then apply these and design the rear. The first thing to note is the basic makeup of the design. Shielding is employed around the top and side surfaces to protect the sensitive internals, but not on every side. We can see where the optics need to be unobstructed out of the front. We can take this in principle. Anything that needs to interact with the outside world, or the user needs access to, must be exposed. We can also see, where possible, the metal shielding is milled out. This is done to reduce the weight, but retain the overall structural integrity. This was another simple rule to incorporate into the back area. The concept image gives us clues to what the purpose of the back area is. On the front, we can see clearly it is the business end, with all the sensors and the optics to look out into the world. The cables travelling to the rear allude to some sort of central system or a power source for all of this technology. Building a touch of functional narrative like this, much like a concept artist would, helps direct the look and fills in the blanks for me. Whilst not communicated in the concept, we can presume parts of the structure will have to hold other elements, so will have to be strong enough to support them. Here we can see how the entire back unit is designed to be held in place with a robust clamp and bracket. Another example of this is what holds up these two rear tanks that feature in the concept image. You can see a simple metal shelf was added to help make visual sense of this area. To help with designing the rear unit, we can take a few of the smaller cues from the front area. When a product is mass manufactured like this for the military, the designer will want to make it cost effective and easier to build by limiting the number of unique parts. In other words, use the same types of bolts, switches and buttons wherever you can. Doing this in the art helps communicate that industrial mass produced feel. So in this instance, I recycle the concepted ones from the front into the back. We also know from military designs that they often get iterated on after production. So it's common to see bits added here and there. In a rather crude fashion, they are added to strengthen elements that were found to be too weak. So I added a series of L-shaped beams along the top to suggest this was a correction post its original design specification. A good example of this design language is you'll often see this on military vehicles. 
For example, fighter aircraft get new fins and details added all of the time to help with stability and airflow. Now let's turn to the materials. As you can see, the concept was only suggestive, but from the reference pool, we can make an educated guess what these might be. We can also take lead from the functionality to help us answer the questions of materials too. Software such as Substance Painter enables you to have less concept direction in the early stages if required, as it's easy to perform look dev on a live asset to a certain degree. As a part of this process, I block out the materials with standard presets to quickly experiment with what may or may not work. This is another example of shifting the workload from concept into later stages of the process to help bring balance on this quick project. As touched on before, with military equipment that's worn on the body, we have to consider the operator. Taking into consideration how comfortable it would be to wear for long periods of time helps direct the material choices. Weight should only be added where strength is required and the material should show that clearly. This breaks down into two elements for me. So here we can see hardened heavy steel on the outside as this will get a fair beating from use. Then lighter plastic internal parts to reduce weight where possible. Thinking about the practicality for the environment it is in, not only at the geometry stage, but the material stage too. As mentioned previously, we have this principle having the metal armour to protect the sensitive components. Because it's designed as a shield, it's fair to assume this is where a lot of the damage will be visible. What also helps guide my thinking on damage is how the gear will make contact with the environment. So the extremities will always get knocked the most, especially on the front corners of the goggles. I also try to think about the direction of movement when the damage occurs, so the route of scratches has context. Also, where parts move frequently, we know there will be more wear present on the surface. This again provides additional information to build detail. The headgear will also be put on and taken off frequently, so over time the leather strap that secures the headgear will become very worn compared to other elements. The concept provides foundational colour direction, but it is important to expand on this. Referring back to the principles of weight saving, even though in the concept the main structure and headphones are uniformly green, these would probably be made from separate materials. In this case, the headphones were set up as a moulded plastic, and as a result the green is tweaked slightly. Moulded plastic colours will always differ from painted metals. Whilst a subtle difference from the concept, it adds that extra attention to detail. The material phase is always an opportunity to try and communicate to the viewer some backstory. When someone gets a new item, there is always an urge to personalise it. The last phone you bought, I'm willing to bet one of the first things you did was personalise it by changing the wallpaper. The same principle can be assumed for our science fiction soldier that would wear this headgear. Also from the reference, I could see the same rules apply when someone is issued with military equipment. Because we know this is a beat up piece of kit that has been used thoroughly, adding some scrawled markings on the side of the headgear reinforces that it was issued to an individual, used for some time, and that they have left their stamp on it. On the topic of equipment being issued to soldiers, military kit is usually assigned on the basis of entire units. Looking to the top band, you can see that I've added reference to that. The front also features a hand-drawn marker that acknowledges the individual within that unit. Personal markings like this can come about for many reasons, not solely because of what I have just described. With something like this headgear, as it covers a lot of the operator's face, you would not be able to distinguish between individuals. As a result, personalisation is added to the outside to rectify that. This is something that the concept does not directly communicate to me to do, but in the spirit of it, it's a worthwhile addition. I should point out, this is not a new phenomenon or anything. We can see as far back as the Second World War, where soldiers would personalise their standard issue kit. Mass produced tanks and aircraft are a good example of this. They often feature artwork or names painted on the outside. The final few points I want to make about the materials is the decals. Translating a 2D concept into the 3D space meant I reviewed the decals to make sure they would be legible and proportionally balanced. The same can be said for the treatment to the LCD screen too. The decals also had to be reworked on areas such as the headphones. This was due to the redesign of the base geometry that was undertaken, but also an opportunity to add in more finer details. For example, the position markings that can be observed around the central screw. This addition gives the impression that depending on the orientation of the screw, functionality of the audio changes for the operator. So before I finally wrap up this talk, I want to touch on one last point about developing the look after the concept art. Even at the point where we could call this headgear asset complete and ready to go into the game, we can still exercise some creative flexibility to change and refine the direction. Modern tools allow much greater flexibility, even at the later stages of production. I will demonstrate this in an example of how that could be applied to the headgear asset. 
I'm sure we're all familiar with how video games these days offer so much more customizability. They let you express your individuality through different looks for your character. It's always cool, right, to have a visual look that other players don't have. There's some prestige to it, especially if you've achieved something noteworthy in the game, and you get a new item for your troubles which you can then show off to your friends. Once an asset like this headgear is complete, we can always return to the concepting phase to explore alternate skins to support these customizability options. So rather than going back to the drawing board, we can perform the look development for these new skins live on the asset. So here I explored 30 alternate looks, simply through colour and material adjustments, in a similar process a concept artist would undertake once the final shape and form is signed off on. The speed and flexibility of the tools meant these were concepted quickly, from which we could then pick, let's say, 10 of the strongest ideas to go forward into the final game. So really, you're concepting, proving out an idea, and creating the final asset simultaneously. The best of all worlds, and a very efficient process if you already have the asset available. Hopefully this demonstrates how even at the end of production, we can still explore the look, change things, and try and find that extra bit of quality, or in this case, extended value. If you wish to take a closer look at any of the artwork from this talk, you can see the full project on my ArtStation page. Sean's concept work is also linked there too. Hopefully, this short talk has given some insight into how the creative process can continue well after the concept stage, and also how we can continue to push the quality through adding more detail. Thank you for listening. My name is David Woodman, and I will see you at the Q&A session after today's talks.